Mark exited the doctor's office feeling downcast. His words spoke volumes, improvements are not yet visible. When will they become apparent? Mark wondered. Did he waste so much money on this treatment? It's as if he's ruined the entire business with these procedures and pills. And competitors are always on the prowl, ready to undermine. It's understandable, weakness isn't respected in their circle. A weak man isn't reliable. In business, he's like a lost wanderer in a swamp. Ah, uh, my mother was right. There's nothing to do in this town, and yet I rushed into everything. I won't make it, she said. And here I am, giving up everything. And to think, I was once a school teacher, Mark thought as he closed the door of the private clinic behind him. His mood was practically at rock bottom. And then there's this weakness and dizziness. Can I really sit behind the wheel in such a condition? No, clearly not worth it. Maybe I should hire a personal driver. But where would I even go? Just wasting money for nothing, Mark pondered. He never got behind the wheel of his once trendy foreign car. After all, life wasn't so bleak as to head to the other side. His business partner, Nicholas, had a simple response to this. Yes, Sam, you need to rest. Breathe fresh air, get some sleep. So that in the morning, it steamed milk, and during the day, bird songs and the smell of freshly mown grass. Ah, romance. Well, that's when your healthy, rural beauty pleases you. But when you don't know how much time you have left, you start thinking differently, Mark retorted. Nicholas then gave his partner an assessing look, as if actually calculating how much time he had left. Shaking off unpleasant memories, Mark shook his head and nearly lost his balance due to the sudden weakness. The businessman stopped, clutching onto a lamppost. Passersby cautiously walked past, thinking he was drunk. But Mark hadn't touched alcohol in over two months since he found out he was seriously ill. His attending physician, Rick, was evasive about it. He kept prescribing tests and examinations that hardly helped the patient. If anyone else were in Mark's shoes, they would have surely caused a scene, demanding explanations. But Mark was extremely modest when it came to medical matters and felt uncomfortable every time he crossed the threshold of the doctor's office. A wave of weakness surged with renewed force, and Mark couldn't cope with it anymore. Losing his balance, he stepped off the sidewalk and nearly collapsed onto the road. Mark's consciousness blurred as he heard the loud honking of passing cars. Then, there was screeching, and something very large and dark loomed over him. At first, Mark thought he had blacked out, but that wasn't the case. He simply lost his remaining strength and found himself on the roadside. Everything swirled before his eyes as if after a powerful knockout blow. Mark attempted to rise, but it was rather awkward. Hey, man, what are you doing out here so early? Have you had enough of life or something? Throwing yourself under the wheels like a madman, a rough male voice grumbled near his ear. Mark looked up and only now noticed a yellow bus standing about a meter away, its body slightly turned from the abrupt braking. I'm sorry, please. It's all because of my illness, he replied weakly. The bus driver leaned over him and exclaimed in surprise, you really seem sober. But man, you're all twisted up. Let me help you. How are you? Can you stand up, or should I call an ambulance? Mark waved his hands in protest. No, no need for any doctors. Yes, I just came out of the hospital. I'll manage. I already feel a bit better. The bus driver sighed heavily and promptly helped the businessman to his feet. Suddenly, Mark felt a strong urge to thank the kind man. Who knows what might happen? Will they ever meet again? and he wouldn't remember the bus number for sure. Mark reached into his pocket and, to his regret, 
realized there was no cash, only bank cards. But what good were they when he still had to reach an ATM? Surprisingly, the solution came immediately. Mark touched his left wrist and swiftly removed his watch. Here, please take it. Just don't refuse, okay? It's for the trouble and for not running me over. Although, it might have been better if you did, he said. The bus driver was taken aback and shrugged uncertainly. Yeah, calm down, buddy. Don't get all worked up. And these are nice watches. They'll come in handy for you. Probably didn't come cheap. Mark forced a smile. No, take them. I mean it sincerely. I won't need them anymore. The man hesitated for a moment, then reluctantly accepted the gift. Thanks, buddy. Just don't lose heart, okay? And remember, all illnesses are from nerves, he called out from the bus cabin as a farewell. Mark waved after him and slowly made his way home. The elite high-rise where his apartment was located could be seen from afar. Sixteen floors, an underground parking lot, a closed children's playground, and even a gym with a pool on top of it all. The elite reside in such buildings. What a beauty. You look out the window in the morning, and the whole city is at your fingertips. However, Mark was no longer pleased by this. Nodding to the board security guard in the lobby, he headed for the elevator. He lived on the third floor, and in good times, he always took the stairs. But today wasn't the most convenient time for climbing. However, as he was about to press the elevator button, a familiar voice called out to him. Mark, wait, please. Mark turned around and saw the hurried security guard approaching him. He was a man in his thirties, almost his peer. Yes, what is it? Mark responded in a businesslike yet respectful tone. Of course, due to his position, he could easily address the guard informally, but he chose not to. Essentially, everyone is equal before each other. It's just that each person has their place, some deal with business, while others guard the peace of the residents of the high-rise. Mark, here's the thing. Could you possibly help me with something work-related? The out-of-breath guard began. Mark raised an eyebrow in surprise and asked through force, what happened? Isn't the security desk a decent place anymore? The man in uniform hesitated. Well, how should I put it? The place isn't bad, really. It's warm, peaceful, and the residents are reasonable. You know, just watch the surveillance cameras and keep an eye on things. The businessman gave him an expressive look, as if indicating, enough with the pleasantries, let's get to the point. The guard sniffed oddly and continued. Good job, I can't complain, but the pay is a bit low. And my little son, well, he's just two years old, poor thing. His leg was curved at birth. He needs surgery. We've queued up for a quota, of course, but there's complete silence so far. And we can't afford to wait. The doctors are pushing, hence the need for money. The businessman nodded sympathetically. Well, what can I do to help? Contribute money for the surgery? Well, it's not a problem for a child. Give me the clinic details and I'll transfer. Maybe not the full amount, but I'll try to cover at least something. The security guard noticeably perked up, a different tone creeping into his voice. Thank you, Mark, but what I really need is a job at your company. I've heard they need people for the cash collection service, so I'm ready. And I have experience. I used to work as a gamekeeper. The security guard story intrigued Mark even more, momentarily distracting him from his own discomfort. A gamekeeper, you say? That's a good background. Why did you switch to security? The interlocutor looked sheepish. Yes, I was a convict, a criminal, to put it bluntly. An accident while hunting. Wealthy folks accidentally shot at a drunken bench. 
They all survived, but I got blamed anyway. Well, to save face, I suppose. I thought they'd give me a suspended sentence or at worst a year or two. But they gave me seven years. Well, I served two-thirds and got out early. The prison warden turned out to be a decent guy, helped with the job. Without his protection, I would never have been accepted into security. And now, my sons got into trouble. Mark frowned, I see. I'll think about it, but leave me the clinic details. I'll go up to my apartment now and transfer immediately. As for the job, I'm not against it, but my business partner is very particular about ex-cons. Tears glistened in the security guard's eyes. Thank you. I'll be indebted to you for life. Mark waved his hand and pressed the elevator button. Not that he was such a benefactor or a saint far from it. Mark had his own faults, more than one, but children had always been his weakness. How could he not help the security guard's son? The little one is only two years old. He could end up crippled for life. And children, they are the future. Well, and Mark wouldn't become poor. He wanted to buy a car, but what's the point now when he can't even drive? And who knows how long he has left to live? A year? Two? Maybe even less? Approaching the door of his apartment, Mark didn't press the doorbell and pulled out a bunch of keys from his pocket. Seeing one of them, the oldest and most worn out, the businessman shuddered. This key was from his parents' house. His mother still lived there. She lived all alone, abandoned by everyone. And first and foremost, by her own son. Pushing unpleasant memories aside, Mark inserted the key into the lock and turned it counterclockwise. The apartment smelled of something fried and very delicious. Mark smiled. Tiffany, smart girl, had arranged delivery from the restaurant. She couldn't cook herself, especially meat. Once he put a duck in the oven, and she went out to the balcony, chatting with her friend about this and that. She only remembered when black smoke started pouring out. Since then, cooking and Tiffany became incompatible. Then Mark heard voices. There were two, male and female. They came from the bedroom. One belonged to his wife Tiffany, but the other. Oh God, it's Nicholas. But what is he doing here? They can't stand each other, flashed through the businessman's mind. The truth turned out to be unpleasant. Mark had heard similar stories from acquaintances and old jokes, but seeing it in person. Oh God, how disgusting. Tiffany and Nicholas were lying in each other's arms, openly discussing their future. Mark even managed to make out the word wedding in the conversation. Blood rushed to his head, filling his consciousness with a flame of anger. Seeing his business partner in the doorway, Nicholas didn't flinch and pointed to a chair. Sit down, Mark. Don't get all worked up. Stunned by the unexpectedness, Mark was dumbfounded and stood rooted to the spot. No need for drama, Mark. Nicholas and I love each other and want to get married, Tiffany said, smiling seductively. Yeah, as if he's going to erase us. You should be more concerned about yourself, Mr. Eraser. You might just give your soul to God soon. And you have no more business in business. I held a closed meeting with shareholders yesterday. You were removed from your position. So, you can go back to your village swamp. Nicholas retorted without losing his own dignity. Mark's face turned crimson, and a sinister gleam appeared in his eyes. Get out of my apartment right now, before I throw you out like mischievous kittens. Tiffany smirked and began twirling a fiery red lock around her finger. Mark, what's wrong with you today? Everything you say is off the mark. Don't forget, the apartment is in my name, or did you forget? Don't you have a rural registration? Couldn't be bothered to deregister, thought you'd get away with it. 
Well, now here you are. Collect your belongings and get out. Only now did Mark realize that this was it. He had been defeated on all fronts. With a resigned wave of his hand, he walked into the room that had served as his office for several years to fulfill the promise he made to the security guard at the entrance. There, the businessman leisurely took out his phone from his pocket and called a friend working at the bank. After some friction and negotiation, the necessary amount was transferred to the account of the medical institution where the boy was supposed to undergo surgery. Mark made the money transfer almost automatically, without hesitating for a second. At this point, he didn't care anymore. He just wanted to leave this hateful apartment as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the joyful voices of Tiffany and Nicholas continued to echo from the bedroom, making him grind his teeth in impotent rage. Mark's state was miserable, his head was spinning, and his mouth was parched and desperately in need of water. Unfortunately, there was no water in the office, and he didn't want to go to the kitchen, bypassing the bedroom with the lovers. Mark realized that he had shown himself to be a coward in this situation. If he were a real man, he would have surely engaged in a confrontation with fists flying and foul words shouted at the top of his lungs. But in his current condition, he wouldn't even be able to handle a child. The businessman's hands drooped lifelessly, and his lips tightened into a single line. Gathering everything he needed in his bag, Mark left the apartment, slamming the door loudly in farewell. What else could he do? Listen to their joyful exclamations or feel like a failure? No, enough. Mark was in such a broken state that he didn't even bother to call the elevator and somehow managed to descend the stairs. The security guard greeted him with a sympathetic look. Did you know? Mark asked sadly. The guard nodded and immediately averted his gaze. Why didn't you tell me right away? Were you feeling sorry for me? The businessman asked again. The guard looked directly into his eyes. Why didn't I tell you? I did tell you, and quite clearly. I sent you an anonymous letter in a sealed envelope, along with video surveillance footage. I left it in the mailbox. It shows, well, what your wife's friend does with her in your absence. Mark shook his head in dismay. When was the last time he checked the mail? Well, what's the point of clenching his fists now when the fight is over? All right, farewell. Don't mention the bad. I'm leaving, and I've transferred the money to your son. I've paid off about 70%. Add a little of your own, and that's it, Mark said as he headed for the door. Only when faced with his wife's and friend's betrayal did he realize that he needed to return to where it all began. Thinking about it, Mark understood. He couldn't leave now. Oh no, he couldn't. His partner would take over the whole business and wouldn't even say thank you. Nicholas turned out to be very quick. He had already managed to quietly hold a shareholders meeting. And there, everyone was just waiting for the funeral arrangements for Mark to be possible. And none other than Nicholas would say a farewell word at the fresh grave among the first. He'd benefit from it. And they started seven years ago as newcomers. Mark came from a remote village to the city. He abandoned everything his job, his parents' house, and most importantly, his mother. And he left so disgracefully. He took all the savings from the jewelry box and ran away in the dark of night. He wanted to do it in the morning, but he realized that his mother might see his shameful escape. For the past 20 years, Kelly had worked as a milkmaid. She was used to getting up at dawn, so she could easily catch her beloved son in such a shameful act. Seven years had passed, but it seemed like just yesterday. Mark sat on a passing bus. He stood for several stops because there were no empty seats. And then the driver sat Mark next to him and winked like a buddy. Probably going to earn a living, young man? The driver asked cautiously, fearing to reveal too much. 
Mark nodded cautiously. He had been to the city before when he was studying to be a translator at the Institute. And when he returned to his native village, he became a foreign language teacher. The driver smiled knowingly. He had seen such cases many times before. People didn't leave for nowhere out of the goodness of their hearts. Circumstances forced them, that's for sure. But could he make it work in a new place? Nobody knew. But Mark managed. He worked tirelessly in the office, traded everything imaginable, and slowly climbed the career ladder. Not alone, of course, but with his unfortunate buddy Nicholas. His friend was always shrewder. He would set one up and outsmart another at the turn. Before you knew it, he'd be crowned. He'd have drowned Mark, dragged him into the swamp. But Mark, as luck would have it, knew foreign languages well, and without them, he couldn't negotiate with foreign partners. Successful deals followed one after another. Mark rose higher and higher, and with him grew Nicholas, who no one took seriously at first. Mark was different, erudite, charming. And how many languages he knew, enough to outdo any translator. Remembering this on his way to the railway station, Mark smiled to himself. At the same time, he didn't fear that passers-by would take him for a madman. Let them think what they wanted. That's their personal right. Realizing that he was running low on money, Mark decided to buy a train ticket and go to his native village by rail. He had always liked the rhythmic clacking of the wheels on the tracks clack clack, clack clack. Just look out the window and sip the tea brought by the obliging conductor. Unfortunately, today was not Mark's lucky day. No tickets, sir. It's summer, vacation time. You should have booked in advance, the cashier woman snapped with undisguised irritation. Maybe there are, well, at least some standing places. Mark pleaded. She looked at the stranger's pale face with reproach. Well, I said there's nothing. Sir, do I have to repeat it twice? My voice has already disappeared twice, and you're still like little children. Take what's given. Mark nodded and stepped aside. And just an hour ago, he had a decent sum with him, but it went to the treatment of the guard's son. So, there was no point regretting it. What if this was the last good deed he managed to do in his life? And how am I supposed to get to the village now? I can't afford a taxi, and I'm scared to drive myself. I might end up in an accident and hurt someone innocent, Mark thought with dismay. There was only one way out the bus. Well, nothing. Who has it easy now? I'll get there somehow. The main thing is for Mom to accept me. Maybe she'll kick me out. After all, we haven't seen each other for seven years, Mark tried to reassure himself. He was already feeling very low when Luck finally smiled at him in the form of an older truck driver. Seeing Mark standing by the road with a bag in his hand, the man opened the door and shouted from the depths of the cabin with a hoarse voice. Hey, brother, where are you heading, anyway? I need to get to the village, Mark replied uncertainly. The driver's face lit up with a satisfied smile. To the village, you say? Then we're going the same way. Hop in, don't hesitate. I'm alone, and you know how it is on the road. Anything can happen. It's not right to wander around the country alone. Joyful sparks lit up in the businessman's eyes. Finally, luck. The truck driver turned out to be a quite pleasant fellow who skillfully told stories from his life, more resembling tall tales. Mark listened half-heartedly, mostly nodding off, stubbornly fighting off drowsiness. It took about five hours for the entire journey, during which Mark only thought about one thing, how his mother would greet him. Would she really kick him out? Remember the theft of hard-earned money from the jewelry box. Why did I act so despicably? Why did I steal from my own mother? 
and a former teacher, too. Yes, you're a thief, Mark. A vile and shameless thief. Mark chatted himself on the way home. As often happens in such cases, the village was relatively remote from the highway where the driver dropped him off. And this meant that the exhausted businessman had to walk several kilometers with a bag over his shoulder under the scorching June sun. Mark smiled to himself and trudged towards the village, taking the half-ruined mill building as his landmark. It used to work at full capacity, and Mom always baked pancakes for Mark from freshly ground flour. And fritters, pies, and Mark loved his mother's baking. Simple, unpretentious, but no less delicious for it. You'd pick up such a pie, and it's like a sponge, it breathes steam, spreading a divine aroma around itself, and the porous dough made it practically weightless and pleasant to the stomach. That's how Mom cooked for Mark. And she was a self-taught cook, mastering all the secrets of village cuisine during her years in the province. The last time Mark had such a delicacy was seven years ago, the day before his despicable act and escape from home under the cover of night. Since then, he hadn't eaten better than his mother's home cooking anywhere. No matter which restaurant he entered, it was all the same, exotic dishes, sauces whose names could make your tongue curl, and unparalleled luxury. Waiters bustled about, the head chef shouted, and a singer crooned from the restaurant stage. It seemed like indescribable beauty, luxury, wealth, yet there was still no comfort in his soul. Because nothing in life could compare to dinner in the village, when the table was laid out with the gifts from the garden after a hard day's work. Cucumbers, tomatoes, boiled potatoes, and butter, oh, how could one do without it? No stickling bread, often white, but no one would refuse rye either. And all these Caesar salads and foreign foie gras seemed like insignificant novelties. Eating the good, and not eating, we'll manage without it. Remembering the tastes from his mother's table, Mark felt a strong sense of hunger. His mouth instantly filled with saliva, and his stomach growled insistently, urging him to pick up the pace. This is a good sign. When was the last time I had such a ravenous appetite? I can't even remember. Maybe Nicholas was right when he suggested disappearing into the wilderness. He was a traitor, of course, and there's no forgiving him, but he thought right, that's for sure, Mark thought, and voluntarily quickening his pace. To his sincere surprise, the businessman noted that his step became more confident, and his head cleared noticeably, no longer as heavy as a cast-iron cauldron. Of course, this couldn't be considered a cure. But considering his dire situation, it was the best that could happen to him today. Despite the fact that the time had long past noon, there was no coolness in the air. Sweat poured down the face of the businessman, accustomed to traveling by car with air conditioning. And here he was, hoofing it to his parents' house, where the best years of his life had gone by. Oh, how much of a fool I was. Chasing after money, but losing more than I gained, my mother's trust. Well, what do I need this city for? Mark asked aloud. The sound of his own voice against the backdrop of rural solitude seemed unnatural and somewhat frivolous, somehow. Suddenly, a strange squeak was heard a couple of meters from the road. As if a child had hidden behind the haystack to play with a limping old man. Mark stopped and set his bag down on the sun-warmed, merciless earth. The strange squeak repeated itself, causing Mark to take a couple of steps towards the nearest wild rose bush. By mid-June, it had already bloomed, and the man involuntarily remembered that at this time of year, the Christian carp bites well in the village pond. Mark approached even closer and carefully circled the prickly bush, which spread its branches in all directions like a giant spider. And he looked more closely and was amazed, in the grass lay the fiery red body of some small animal. It was larger than a cat, but definitely didn't reach the size of a large dog. It's a teenage fox. 
but still quite large. What happened to it? Mark asked with concern, touching the reddish animal with his hand. The fox trembled all over and then whimpered plaintively. Just like a child when their favorite toy is taken away. Hey, buddy, what's wrong with your paw? Mark asked quietly. And he said it in such a tone as if the fox could actually answer him. The red creature squeaked again and tried to lift its front paw, on which some strange object glistened. A trap flashed in Mark's mind. But how do I remove it? What if the fox clamps onto my hand with a death grip? Deciding to protect himself, Mark took out one of his shirts from the bag and wrapped his hand with it for safety. However, caution proved unnecessary as the fox endured the entire process of removing the trap stoically. And at the end, it even licked Mark's hand. Wow, what a kind soul. And they say foxes are vicious and cunning animals. Mark wiped away a tear that had welled up. The red creature gratefully squeaked and tried to stand up, but at that moment, with a low groan, it collapsed on its side. Easy, easy. Where are you hurrying off to? I'm not a doctor, but it seems to me that your paw is broken. How about I take you with me? My mom, you know her, right? She can fix anyone up. You just have to endure a bit. Will you manage? Mark asked. In response, the fox sneezed amusingly and eagerly looked at its savior with its button eyes. Got it, not a fool. Well then, hang tight, little one, we're about to hit the road. I'll put you in my bag, okay? But I won't close it, or you'll suffocate in there. Ah, uh, too bad there's no water. I could really use a well right now, to quench my thirst, Mark concluded, carefully placing the fox cub into the bag. The cub behaved quietly, only occasionally whimpering when Mark awkwardly lifted the bag over another bump. Finally, the village appeared ahead. Low houses, wicker fences, and gates leaning to one side. From one end of the village came the distinct mowing of cows. From the other end, the clucking of chickens and the plaintive bleating of goats. Together, these sounds merged into a single hum, understood only by the person whose childhood was spent in this beloved village. Mark knew he had to walk another 200 meters before the roof of his parents' house would appear. Once, there stood only a small farmhouse, which his late father and grandfather rebuilt into a solid home. The businessman's heart beat faster. There it was, his mother's garden, neat rows of potatoes planted a couple of months ago, and a small greenhouse with tomato and pepper seedlings. A little further off, he could see the well, the water from which Mark had been dreaming about for the past two hours, like heavenly manna. Well, here we are. See that gate? We'll open it, and our adventure together will end, Mark said, patting the fox cub on the head. The sharp-nosed face of the little animal immediately turned towards the summer kitchen, where his mother, it seemed, was preparing dinner. Mark took a few steps towards the gate and froze in surprise. Standing next to the fence were two people, a slender woman around thirty with a frightened look and a seven-year-old boy who looked at the world with his inherent childish curiosity. Seeing the tall, thin man with a bag in his hands, the couple tensed. Especially the woman, who looked very much like a vagabond. Mother and son, probably. Judging by their appearance, just like homeless people. Although, you haven't strayed far from them yourself, Mark. You don't look too good either, the businessman thought to himself. Hello, mister. Are you from this house? Probably, the boy broke the awkward silence. Yes, from this one. Just haven't been home in about seven years, at least, Mark replied, embarrassed. A minute later, the noise of the opening door was heard, and on the doorstep of the house appeared the easily recognizable profile of his beloved mother. Mark, my dear. 
Is that you? You've returned, my good boy. Killy exclaimed, tears streaming down her cheeks. Mark paled and dropped the bag from his hands in surprise. At that moment, the fox cub sitting inside whimpered sadly, which didn't escape the boy's notice. Hey, mister, why is something squeaking in your bag? A toy, maybe? Can I see? the boy asked. Mark glanced at the boy's mother. It's a fox cub. It was caught in a trap on its paw, and I found it and rescued it. He didn't get to finish because at that moment the gate swung open and the reddened Kelly appeared. Over these seven years, his mother had hardly changed, only the wrinkles on her forehead had become deeper and new ones had appeared at the corners of her forehead. You're back. My dear Mark, she exclaimed and rushed to hug her son. Mark expected to see anything but this. How could his mother forget what he had done, taking the last of her money from the box? But Kelly didn't even think about it now. The most important thing for her at that moment was her son's return. For seven whole years, she had been waiting for her beloved boy to come to his senses and return home. Did she forgive Mark for the money disappearing? Of course she did. How else? When her son was alone and the money. Money was just pieces of paper that could never replace ordinary human joys. Meanwhile, the young vagabond woman and the boy stood on the sidelines, not knowing what to say or how to behave in this awkward situation. Finally, after thoroughly admiring her son, Kelly turned her gaze to the guests. Good evening. Why are you standing there? Come into the yard. I don't bite. Everyone around here knows me. I don't even close the gate during the day. Whoever needs fresh milk comes. Whoever needs eggs. I welcome everyone. Come in, dear guests, and pay no attention to me. I haven't seen my son for seven years. You will excuse me. My heart is pounding. The boy looked questioningly at his mother. Could they? The woman smiled and nodded in agreement. And Mark, in the meantime, extracted the fluffy little fox from the bag and sat it on his lap. Wow, how adorable. Look at those eyes. And the nose. Why is it so wet though? The boy babbled upon seeing the little creature. Mark smiled, then scooped some water from a nearby bucket with his palm and began to feed the cub with it. The fox drank eagerly, pausing only to catch its breath and snuffle its nose a couple of times. Who could have done such a thing to it? In our village, it seems like all the hunters have disappeared, and those who remain respect the laws. They don't bother anyone except ducks during the season, Kelly said, examining the cub's paw with concern. I don't know, Mom. I found it by the road. The trap was without a leash. Looks like the little one got caught in it elsewhere on its body and then chewed through the rope. Well, it kept walking until it couldn't anymore, Mark replied. Can I treat its wound? The boy's mother spoke up. Kelly looked at the guest with undisguised surprise. Are you a veterinarian by any chance? The woman coughed awkwardly and a blush spread across her cheeks. No. I'm a general practitioner, but I know how to treat wounds. Animals, they're almost like people, they just can't speak, the woman said. Kelly looked at her with respect. You're clever. You speak the truth. Dear, help the little one, of course. And I'll bring some bandages and antiseptic. Ma'am, won't it hurt take? Antiseptic burns a lot, the boy worried. No, dear, we'll be careful. And your mother and I will blow on the wound so the little fox won't feel the thing, Kelly reassured him. Mark watched everything unfold and couldn't believe it was happening to him. Just yesterday, he was sitting in his stuffy office, berating employees and scolding the cleaner for not mopping the floor properly. 
And now, he was sitting on a bench outside his village home with an energetic boy and his mother. As he would find out later, her name was Judith, and her son's name was Ben. They had come from the same city as Mark, hitchhiking for several hours. According to Judith, they stumbled upon the village completely by accident. They saw a sign on the road and decided to come, asking for a place to stay in one of the houses. They couldn't explain why they chose Kelly's house. Most likely, it was the warmth of the kind-hearted woman's home that drew them in. Ultimately, that's what determined the choice of this odd couple. Judith seemed reserved and taciturn to Mark. As she treated the fox cub's wound, she kept glancing around, as if fearing an attack from behind. And they had very few personal belongings with them, much less than what Mark himself had taken. Were they in such a hurry that they packed haphazardly? He didn't know the answer to that question. And did he even have the right to ask such things of this lovely, kind woman? Who was he after all? A runaway failed businessman who lost his apartment and wife, to boot. Judith skillfully treated the cub's wound, then deftly applied a neat splint made from a small stick and a piece of elastic bandage. There, in a week or two, you'll be as good as new, she said with a smile. Your hands are golden. The little one didn't even flinch. If you ever decide to stay in the village, you won't go hungry, that's for sure. We actually need a specialist at the medical post, just so you know, Kelly remarked with respect. Oh, no, it's nothing, really. I was just really worried and afraid of hurting the little fox, Judith waved it off. After spending a little more time outside, Kelly invited everyone inside. Come on, come on. I've already set the table, potatoes, homegrown eggs, fried fish, and pastries with apple jam. All from our garden, no chemicals, as they say. Well, the fish was brought by our neighbor Jerry yesterday. He doesn't eat it himself. Says it's the process that matters to him. What a guy. And he's a fisherman too, you won't find many like him. Mark let Judith and her son go ahead and lingered at the door to apologize to his mother. For everything, for the theft, for his indifference, and for seven years of uncertainty. But Kelly had already guessed her son's intention and kindly said, No need, Mark, I already know everything. A local fortune teller predicted my fate. She's a top-notch seer, never wrong. His mother's words left him feeling unsettled. And what did she say, Mom? Well, if it's not a secret, of course. Since irony froze in her son's eyes, Kelly didn't bother telling him the whole truth. No, darling, it's not the right time to talk about it yet, or you might jinx your fate. Wait until the right moment, then please. But for now, it's unnecessary, she said. Mark shook his head. You know, Mom, I don't see the point in all these predictions. I've been really sick. Doctors have run a hundred tests already and still haven't found the cause. Don't take it to heart, son. Sometimes, home is the best medicine. Go to the forest, pick mushrooms and berries, drink a glass of birch juice. Then we'll see what to do next. Now, let's go to the table before everything gets cold. The potatoes are delicious, you'll lick your fingers. Kelly said, stepping across the threshold. Mark nodded in agreement, closing the door behind him. The small kitchen smelled divine. Hungry from the day's events, Ben tapped his spoon against the bottom of his soup bowl, trying not to miss a single drop. Judith ate more restrainedly, but with appetite. Well, how is it? Do you like my stew or not? The hostess asked with a smile. I love it, of course. It's delicious. Ben replied for everyone. Seeing all this splendor on the table, tears welled up in Mark's eyes. 
Perhaps it was nostalgia. Longing for his childhood home, which he had been trying to suppress for seven long years. After dinner, Mark went outside to sit on the bench and contemplate his next steps. At that moment, the phone in his pocket buzzed, signaling the arrival of another text message. Mark grimaced, then glanced at the screen. The sender was his unfaithful wife, Tiffany, informing him that she had filed for divorce and was actively preparing for her wedding with Nicholas. Mark smirked, then sent a brief good luck with love message. For some reason, he didn't feel any anger towards Tiffany. Watching your husband fade away before your eyes, it's not a pleasant sight. She had always been a woman with ambitions and high demands, and Mark simply didn't live up to her expectations. Well, what else is there to say? Mark sat on the bench, scratching the fox's ear and contemplating his thoughts. He wouldn't abandon treatment, of course, but he would stop taking all these mixtures and pills. They only made things worse, as the side effects of these medications were much worse than the symptoms of the illness itself. Sitting on the bench of his childhood home was pleasant. His father, Simon, had built this bench. He truly was a jack-of-all-trades. If you wanted something for the house made of wood, he would create it, and if you asked for something better, he would definitely carve a toy, a whistle, or a miniature animal figurine. I really should go to the forest tomorrow. Take the fox for a walk and a stroll would do me good, Mark said and entered the dark house. Judith and Ben were already asleep in the guest room. Only Kelly sat in the kitchen with a pile of dry buckwheat on the table in front of her. She liked to sift through the tiny grains with her fingers, setting aside rare husks and chaff. Mom, I want to get up early tomorrow. I'm thinking of going to the forest with Tyke and Ben. They don't know about it yet, but never mind, it'll be a surprise. If anything, wake me up to prepare. I want to fill the thermos or something, Mark said from the doorway. Kelly smiled and, adjusting her glasses, nodded in agreement. All right, son, I'll make sure to wake you up. And I'll give you some fresh milk and a crust of bread for the road. Mark lovingly looked at his mother, silently vowing to never leave her alone. As soon as he touched the pillow, the arms of Morpheus became so strong that he instantly fell asleep. Mark's dreams were colorful and unsettling. He dreamed of Tiffany's wedding, Nicholas's cheerful laughter, and the popping champagne. Guests shouted cheers, and the newlyweds couldn't tear themselves away from each other. In his dream, Tiffany's wedding to her former colleague seemed opulent to Mark. Understandably so, Nicholas was no fool. He quickly figured out how to benefit from it all. How much money had he stolen from the company's accounts only God knew. Mark's friends had told him time and again, trust, but verify. He would have installed surveillance cameras in the office, bugged his partner's office, and stayed informed about everything happening within the office walls. But now, what's the point of reasoning and pouring from empty to empty? It's too late anyway. Meanwhile, Kelly had gone to bed long after midnight, having stayed in the kitchen. And then, for about an hour, she read prayers for the well-being of her beloved son. She could see that Mark had become very emaciated. He had turned into a shadow of himself. This business had completely worn him out. He had tried so hard, sacrificing nights. He could have stayed and taught foreign languages to children, as they had suggested. But he didn't want to. He chased after money. They took all his strength in the end. They say money is the root of all evil, and she couldn't agree more. Mark wasn't lucky with his wife either. It was at Tiffany's direction that the groom's mother wasn't invited to the wedding, as if it were her idea. Kelly, of course, felt hurt. But what could she do? Her son was his own master. He wasn't a child anymore. Kelly only found out about the wedding by accident. 
Someone brought the city newspaper, intending to use it as kindling for the stove, but when they saw a photo on the back, they paused. It was a picture of Kelly's son, Mark, arm in arm with the bride. Well, how could you not show such a photo to the whole village? And then the local gossips got involved. They started mocking Kelly behind her back, saying things like, what a good mother raised her son. But he didn't even invite his own mother to the wedding. Kelly, of course, didn't tell anyone about the missing money from her box. She pitied her beloved son. She believed he would come to his senses and return. She waited for seven years, and finally, her patience paid off. Now Mark's life would take a completely different turn. In the morning, he woke up on his own, without his mother's help or the neighbor's rooster crowing. Goodness gracious! Why scream so early? I'll take Tack out and let him visit you. His voice is angelic. It'll soothe you. Mark threatened with a sleepy fist. Judith was already up and about, bustling around the house like a whirlwind, helping Kelly with household chores. From the outside, you wouldn't guess she was from the city, Mark thought with respect, as he went to wash his face outside with the simultaneously cold and sweet water from the well. The illness hadn't gone away, but its symptoms had slightly appeared, as if the doctor had prescribed him a hefty dose of painkillers. When Judith heard that Mark was planning to go into the forest for mushrooms and berries, she decided to join his small group, consisting of Ben and the fox tyke. But before sending her son off, Kelly handed him a greased bundle. Here, take this. There are eggs in the bag, potatoes, and a chicken leg. I'll add some milk and apple turnovers. Ben loved them yesterday. Mom, come on. There's enough food here for a whole week. Even the three of us, me, Judith, and Ben, couldn't eat it all in a month. Mark protested. Take it, Mark, and don't be stubborn. Remember my words, you'll find it's not enough, she insisted. He waved his hand resignedly, but still took the bundle. He didn't want to disappoint his mother. After all, she had tried so hard, putting it together with love. When Ben woke up, he was greeted with a pleasant surprise, a walk in the real forest with his mom and kind Uncle Mark. And there was even a fox. It was like a fairy tale. Since Mark had been in these places before, the role of guide fell to him. With a leisurely pace, he led them out of the village and towards the forest. Tyke, due to his injury, was in the bag, observing the world with his characteristic calmness and caution. The locals looked at Mark reproachfully. There he is, the former school teacher. Came back a failure. Wanted everything in his city, but what good did it do? He returned pale, like a ghost, not even recognizing himself. He felt a wave of negativity from his fellow villagers, but in response, he simply cast his eyes down and continued walking forward. When the forest came into view, Mark noticeably relaxed. Well, now he wouldn't have to hang his head in shame. The forest father would always help and comfort. Look how the branches of the spruce waved welcomingly. And the magpies? They caught as if they were a hospitable hostess, awaiting her husband's return. Feeling the strength emanating from the dark greenery, Mark cautiously asked, Judith, why did you and Ben move to the village? You're city folk, aren't you? She sighed sadly. Yes, Mark, that's right. But we didn't have any other choice. Ben isn't my biological child, just so you know. His parents died in an accident, and his grandfather raised him from the age of two. I was a general practitioner in the area where this man, Archibald, ran a profitable business almost single-handedly. He had hopes for his son and daughter-in-law, but it wasn't meant to be. He buried them all, including his wife, before he died. But she left before the children died. She was very ill. 
and a couple of months ago, Archibald fell ill. He complained of weakness and morning sickness. I tried to treat him, but he was too busy. He surrounded himself with bad people, greedy, cruel. They set their sights on his estate. And what does an elderly man need at the end of his life? Care and attention. Those scoundrels provided it all. They said they'd carry him on their hands, but only if he drew up a will naming them as advisors to his grandson. And when Ben grows up, he'll get everything at once. They said it was an investment in the future, and the boy wouldn't end up in an orphanage. He'd stay with his guardians, Judith continued. And what? Did he believe? Yeah, sounds like nonsense. Mark couldn't help but exclaim. Judith shook her head in dismay. Well, that's understandable to you, Mark. Archibald would take on any opportunity back then, without thinking twice. Just to help his grandson and secure his future. I've been to his house several times, seeing where things were going. They would live off the old man and pocket the money. I tried to help, but Archibald always refused. And then he was gone. And by the will, all these finances went to those guardians, right? The businessman asked again. Well, not quite like that, of course. The house and real estate did indeed go to the scammers. But that's just a drop in the ocean. The main assets are in the bank, and only Ben can access them because he memorized the secret code by heart. His grandfather prepared him for this for about a month and a half. He would wake him up at night and ask for the code. And when Archibald was gone, I secretly took Ben with me. I had to quit my job and go into hiding. So, they are looking for us, Mark. That's why we're hiding in the village, Judith said, instinctively looking around. Well, that's quite a situation. Honestly, I think it wouldn't hurt for you to go to the police. I myself don't feel great, getting worse day by day. I consulted a well-known doctor at the clinic, but it didn't help at all. Weakness, dizziness, nausea. But you stay as long as you need. There's plenty of room in the house for everyone. My mom, certainly, won't mind, Mark said with genuine sympathy in his voice. Thank you for your support. Sorry for the question, but who did you see for treatment? What's the doctor's name? You know, I'm not unfamiliar with the medical world, Judith asked, furrowing her brow. Brown. Rendell Brown, Mark said without any ulterior motive. What? What? Brown? She asked again. Well, yeah, Brown. Why? Any issues? Judith suddenly paled and her expression changed. Mark, you probably don't know much, but Rendell Brown lost his medical license two years ago. So, last month, no matter how much he wanted to, he couldn't have treated you. Surprised, Mark almost dropped the bag with the fox cub from his hands. So, what does this mean? Was I treated by a licensed charlatan? Judith sighed sadly and shrugged. And the medications they gave you were probably cheap counterfeits. Yes, and anyway, judging by the symptoms, you need to get a tomography done. Mark walked through the forest, unable to believe that he had been deceived all this time. And it was Tiffany who recommended this doctor to him. At that moment, a veil literally fell from his eyes. So that's why Tiffany and Nicholas insisted on treatment with this quack. Shaking his head, Mark led his group into the forest, where he knew there was a very nice clearing with mushrooms. Wow, Uncle Mark. What a beauty. Look, a little red mushroom. Ben exclaimed and rushed towards a huge mushroom with a strange pattern on its cap. No, no. Darling, that's a fly agaric. Don't touch it, throw it away. Judith shouted and blocked the boy's path with her body. 
Mark smiled and continued to search for edible mushrooms. Step by step, they ventured deeper into the forest, unaware that at that very moment a large black SUV had appeared in the village. Stopping at each house, the strangers were looking for a young woman with a seven-year-old child. After meeting them, the locals crossed themselves and watched the car with unfriendly looks. Finally, the mysterious car stopped at Kelly's house. The trio of strangers slammed the doors and briskly opened the gate. The cautious woman immediately understood what was going on, especially when she remembered the strange behavior of her young guest and her son. Closing the door with a latch, Kelly immediately began to dial the number of the local police officer. Hey, hostess, why aren't you welcoming your guests? A rough male voice shouted from the street. Oh, I got a little distracted, honey. I'll open up now. She sang out deliberately sweetly. Kelly didn't do this by chance, aiming to detain the ruffians until the local police officer arrived, who was already calling everyone who could help with the detainment. Clanking with the metal bits, she showed with all her appearance that she couldn't open the stubborn latch. But for the thugs who were relentlessly pursuing the young heir, it no longer mattered. A powerful blow near the lock, and the door fell off its hinges with a nasty squeal. Kelly fell on her back, while the young men quickly rummaged through the bag carelessly left by Judith on the chair. Ah, here's the proof. Boss, they were definitely here. One of the leader's henchmen roared. Kelly's heart betrayed her, that was it, her deception was exposed. In an hour or so, Mark and Judith would return home, and a skillfully disguised ambush would await them. However, the attackers didn't take into account one thing, the united community of villagers, who immediately responded to the police officer's call and armed themselves with pitchforks, shovels, and anything else they could lay their hands on. Surrounding Kelly's house, the men slowly closed in. Initially, the attackers tried to threaten with violence and criminal prosecution, but when they realized there was no way out, they decided to break through. And of course, they were apprehended and brought to the district police station in their own car. During the interrogation, it turned out that two out of the three detainees were wanted for a series of robberies and muggings of elderly people. Thanks to Kelly's resourcefulness, the villains were incarcerated, and Judith and Ben were able to return to normal life. However, Judith didn't want to go to the city for treatment and chose to stay in the house where they had been so warmly welcomed. To Mark's immense relief, his illness disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared after Judith prescribed him the correct, gentle treatment. As it later turned out, Tiffany and Nicholas had indeed conspired with the disgraced doctor, who had been fooling Mark for a long time by giving him completely useless medication. The conspirators' plan was simple, to remove the paranoid businessman from the game in order to seize his business and apartment. When the deception was exposed, Tiffany and Nicholas were detained the same day. Now they were facing an investigation and a substantial criminal punishment. But Mark was no longer interested in them, as he planned to tie his life with Judith and their adopted son Ben after getting a divorce from his ex-wife. The inheritance of the late grandfather would remain with the boy until he reached adulthood, and Mark pledged to act as a guarantor for the legitimate completion of the transaction. The businessman had enough money from his company, and there were no financial needs for his adopted son. After all, why would Mark need money when he had found true happiness and love, which he had dreamed of for seven long years of his life? Looking at her son, Kelly was sure, with such a loving wife, nothing could frighten him. Well, it was only fitting, as the newlyweds were being watched over by a fox cub named Tyke. 